Dr. Norman Borlaug led the introduction of high-yielding wheat varieties combined with modern agricultural production techniques to Mexico, Pakistan, and India in the 1960s. This green revolution increased the world's food supply and is credited with saving over a billion people from starvation. Dr. Borlaug is one of five people in history to have been awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, and the Congressional Medal of Honor. His name ranks beside those of Dr. Martin Luther King, Ellie Wiesel, Nelson Mandela, and Mother Teresa. Dr. Borlaug, let me begin by saying what a great honor it is to talk with you. Your efforts have helped battle hunger throughout the world. Some people watching this interview may not know very much about you. Would you share some of your background? You see, I'm a product of the worst of the economic collapse of the early 30s when all the local banks went broke and there was food everywhere, farmers couldn't sell it, farmers went broke, and uh, my granddad used to say, look, all of this disaster that's happening, uh, get a good education. If this thing happens to you, when you have an education, you can go into different fields. So. I often reflect on his wisdom that he tried to uh, transfer to me uh, at that early age. Your grandfather certainly was a great influence in your life. What happened after you graduated from high school? After I finished high school, I was so poor I couldn't go to college. And then, uh, in other words, I graduated from high school at 32. And uh, it wasn't until the fall of uh, 33 that I ventured into trying to go to a college or a university. So I went to the University of Minnesota where there were better opportunities for part-time work. I'm certain the Depression affected every aspect of life. Now, one other thing that during this uh, economic collapse of the 30s that I learned in St. Paul, in Minneapolis, the first time in a big city, was that uh, as bad as things were in uh, Iowa and small towns, there was plenty of food. But I got to the cities, and here in October were many people with their hands out asking for nickel to buy bread. That was worse, sleeping on the ground. I saw this human misery, and I think this has played a key role in why I've spent most of my life in third world, hungry, miserable countries, trying to do something about it. Was there anything else besides your grandfather and the Depression that shaped your life? Let me just say one thing. Oh, please. I think that uh, one of the things that uh, helped me to be effective in third world developing countries was uh, my basic knowledge of what I learned on the small farm where I was born and grew up in Howard County, Iowa. But it was what I learned about putting all the pieces together there and in our high school vocational agriculture uh, course that uh, gave me the right start for developing a career that led to spending most of my life in third world uh, development agriculture. You spent much of your life since college, outside of the United States. Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa especially, has gotten much of your attention in the last 10 years. Besides the immediate need of feeding the starving, what is the biggest obstacle you see? Especially the infrastructure, lack of roads and lack of uh, uh, railroads into agricultural areas. Mm -hmm. In colonial times, the railroads in Africa were built to the mines because minerals 
were what was needed by the uh, colonial powers. In contrast, in Asia, during the same period, uh, what did uh, Britain need? An agricultural product, cotton fiber for their textile industry. Mm -hmm. So the railroads were built right into the Punjab, the biggest agricultural production area. And once the railroads were there uh, to move agricultural produce, roads leading to uh, the railhead to deliver the cotton became a part of it. And the road does lots of other things to stimulate development. There will soon be primary schools along that road. And a little later, public health. Some people may be tempted to throw up their hands in hopelessness about the African continent. Ancient, unproductive soils, the lack of infrastructure, as you mentioned, political instability and AIDS are huge problems. Can you see any progress? Yes, there's progress uh, that's been made in Africa in the last uh, 10 to 15 years. In which More in that? some countries. Ghana is one of the a country that's made better progress than most sub-Saharan countries. But there are several others also. Ethiopia included, uh, despite its many problems, in the last 10 years has made a lot of progress. Self-Help International has considered expanding its operation to other countries. As you look around the globe, where do you think we could have the greatest impact? Well, there are many places where you could be, but always uh, there's a factor of dilution, of effect. You try to work in too many places until you have a good uh, outstanding example of success, mm -hmm. and you dilute your possibility of convincing, convincing political leaders in other nations of uh, uh, following the strategy and plans mm -hmm. that uh, you have put on course. Uh, success is uh, contagious. Everybody sees that. So you'd say, if you have success in one place, others will seek you out. Is that it? This was always my strategy. For example, in the 19, mid-60s, when uh, India, Pakistan first, and then the India made spectacular change in food production. First in wheat technology that I and my team had developed in Mexico, which is not an important wheat country, but it fit when properly managed in Pakistan, India, and they became outstanding successes. A decade, decade later, a lot of that same technology is widely used in China. But immediately, when it started taking off in India and Pakistan, there were many other countries that profited and changed production. Turkey, for example, Egypt, uh, Iraq, Iran, all of those countries profited. and. Uh, some of the Latin American, South American countries where wheat was important also. You had your initial successes in wheat, but I know you have interest in other crops like corn or maize, as it's known throughout the world. One of Self-Help's main programs is the promotion of quality protein maize, or QPM. But there are people who believe we should de-emphasize it. In your opinion, should we? No, I think this is one of the projects that uh, self-help is in that should be continued because uh, uh, in the third poor countries of the third world, the cost of meat is beyond the uh, possibilities of uh, attaining attainment by the low-income people. And if you can improve the basic grain from a standpoint of nutrition, like this case, corn, uh, which is really 
the favorite food for most of those countries south of the Sahara. As a matter of fact, in the whole uh, uh, international agricultural research center system, uh, within the last two years, a harvest plus uh, has been added, which is aimed at incorporating into the basic food grains, uh, basic minerals uh, that are frequently deficient. Mm -hmm. That was patterned really after what is happening on high quality protein maize. I have read about that, where scientists are considering ways to add basic vitamins and minerals into cereal crops like corn, wheat, and rice. The product that made the first breakthrough in that, in maize or corn, was uh, high lysine hydryptophan corn. And then, of course, uh, Mary has uh, added the other benefit of uh, adding a little malted flour to this uh, maize mm -hmm. and even adding it to an ordinary maize or corn mm -hmm. used for human consumption improves the uh, nutritive value considerably. Why is QPM so important? Uh, we people here in Iowa who have an abundance of meat, whether pork and beef and chicken and eggs to go with it, we don't think in terms like this, but when those products are unavailable and even, even uh, if they are available in the country, the vast sector of the people doesn't have the money to buy them. If you can improve the nutritive value of the basic grain they live from, you've uh, done a lot to improve their health. You have long opposed deforestation as a way to increase food production. Can we get more production out of the world's existing cropland rather than expanding into more marginal areas? We don't have to cut down forests. We don't have to plow up shallow land that's not suitable for sustainable agriculture. Better to leave it in pastures and grazing land. And by so doing, you don't uh, disrupt uh, nearly as much wildlife habitat, opportunities for outdoor recreation. And as a nation becomes more affluent, smaller and smaller percentage of the total population are engaged in agriculture. And they, became, uh, they become less and less knowledgeable. They think agriculture produced the food for 6.3 billion people we are now, mm -hmm. or 6.4 uh, billion, uh, is a simple job. It's not so and especially do not destroy the environment. Hunger, because of your efforts and others, has dropped dramatically since the 60s, from 40% of the world's population to about 17% today. Yet there are still 850 million malnourished and hungry people in the world. And the worst part of this is that uh, most of the people coming on to the stage of life today uh, are in food deficit nations, not in the fluent nations. Switching subjects, Dr. Borlaug, do you remember your first visit to self-help? I visited uh, Waverly when I went to see the canoes that uh, <laughs> the founder of self had, had uh, used coming down the, yes. from the Hudson Bay to the Mississippi and on to the Down south, to New Orleans, and yeah. so I was fascinated by this. Mm -hmm. That was my first exposure to self-help. You've been involved with Self-Help International for many, many years. What specific part of their efforts do you like? Well, I've been impressed by what uh, Mary has been able to do for self-help in Ghana, and especially in the case of improved nutritive value, maize in Nicaragua. She's done a 
excellent job with a small amount of money behind her. And I like to see efficiency. And uh, she has uh, achieved a lot with the modest sums of money. You bring up funding. Self-Help has never had a huge budget. It's always been a small, efficient, grassroots organization. But nonprofit organizations need donors. If you could deliver one message to people who are considering donating to self-help, what would you tell them? It doesn't necessarily have to be a big organization. Self-help is a very modest organization, but they're doing important work on nutrition improvement through the use of uh, cereals that have uh, basic cereals, in this case, corn. Uh, which has uh, added nutritive value, especially for children. Uh, it's hard for our uh, Americans, especially Midwestern Iowa uh, people, Wisconsin and uh, Illinois and Minnesota, where there's always been an abundance of food, abundance of meat, to appreciate the importance of this uh, improvement of the grain for direct human consumption. But it's very real and very important in uh, those countries where food is grain. We may not appreciate those improvements like we should, but one thing I appreciate is the great cooperation you've received for your projects among such a diverse group of people, scientists, presidents, dictators, bureaucrats. And they all work together from many different countries, many different religions, and many different languages. But uh, they had one common objective, reducing hunger and misery. Finally, Dr. Borlaug, much has been accomplished, yet there's much left to do. What lasting message would you want to give to the people of the United States? Well, that there's still a lot of uh, hungry, miserable people in the world. Uh, and without food, a lot of the other uh, things that we take f for granted as being essential uh, aren't very meaningful. So food is one of the basics. And this is true for all political ideologies, as well as uh, for academic and scientific organizations. They can't uh, function without people who are well nourished.